Good afternoon or good evening. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Prodromo. I am the faculty director of the Initiative on Religion, Law and Diplomacy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. And it's a pleasure to welcome you all back in the fifth segment of our ongoing series called Cultural Heritage in Crisis, a conversation series. Uh, this series has been uh, co-organized and co-sponsored by the Initiative on Religion, Law, and Diplomacy, and also by the uh, Institute for Foreign Policy, or the Foreign Policy Institute in Athens, Greece. And I want to thank, before we begin, all of the organizing team, including um, Mr. Lukas Katsonis, who is the president of the Foreign Policy Institute in Athens, and also uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Aristarchos Grekas, who is at the National and Kapodistrian University in Athens, Greece, along with um, our tech and student leadership teams as well. Um, Brad Maycumber, uh, who is our tech genius, who's helped manage this whole process, and also Francois Venn and Cecilia Rosenman, and also um, a colleague uh, Areti in, um, in Athens, all of whom have taken the lead in helping to make this series a reality. This is our fifth and final segment, and we will be releasing all five of segments in the series as a curated podcast, and we'll be sharing that uh, with you uh, in the next couple of weeks. Today, our, our um, final segment deals with exemplary cases of cultural heritage protection. And we have uh, three um, just tremendous speakers uh, here with us today. Dr. Christina Moranchi, who is at Tufts University. She's the Arthur H. Dadian and uh, Ara Oztemel Professor of Armenian Art and Architecture uh, in the Department of History of Art and Architecture at Tufts. Dr. Eric Williams, who's the Curator of Religion at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And Dr. Tonya Moropulu, who is Professor of Material Sciences and Engineering at the National Technical University of Athens. And all three of these speakers are, are bring a beautiful conclusion to our ongoing conversation because although they're all scholars and they all deal with the world of ideas and theory, they're also all practitioner experts. And they, their, their work on cultural heritage occurs in very different kinds of professional and practitioner spaces. And so they really highlight the diversity and the multidimensionality of cultural heritage as a field in our world today. And I think really help us to understand the ways in which cultural heritage can serve at a time like COVID-19 and, uh, and what's been happening in the US um, with issues related to um, social justice and equity. They can help us understand the way in which cultural heritage on the ground serves as a means to either produce solidarity, understanding and cooperation, or uh, a means of division and divisiveness and fragmentation. So it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here today. And I look forward to uh, hearing from each of you. I think we'll begin with you, Dr. Moranchi, Christina. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thank you for organizing this event. Um, I'm honored to be involved. Uh, it, uh, it, it means a lot to be able to share what I do um, and even to have it be considered an exemplary case. I'm, I'm, I'm flattered and honored to be, to be involved. So what I work on, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a chair of Armenian art here at, at Tufts. What I work on is the Armenian Christian heritage um, of all of historical Armenia and historical Armenia includes not just the Republic of Armenia, the, the present day Republic, but also parts of Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. So it's a wide swath of material heritage um, that includes largely churches, monasteries, but also fortresses, palaces, um, and other kinds of buildings. So um, the, the monuments that I mostly find myself working on are located in Turkey, modern day Turkey. And this presents problems of um, access, problems of um, intervention in essentially sick monuments because of uh, the recent past, the traumatic events of the fairly recent past 
while I work on medieval monuments, um, their afterlife in the 20th century um, has, has, has changed the way we study them. So I'm referring to the Armenian Genocide of 1915 to 1922, um, when uh, Armenians in the Ottoman Empire were systematically deported or exterminated. And what they have left behind um, are not just traumatic memories, but also monuments. And so these monuments stand in Turkey as traces of what is essentially for Armenians uh, a lost homeland. This is personal for me as well as professional. I'm a, a granddaughter of survivors of the Armenian genocide. So I just wanna show you a few examples of the kinds of things that I work on. I'm gonna share the screen and show you um, a few of the hundreds of monuments uh, that are in Turkey, standing in, in what is today Turkey, um, that are Armenian monuments that date anywhere from the fourth century onward. This is a church uh, that dates to the seventh century. I've been working on for many years, both because of its architectural and historical importance, but also because as you can see, it's horrendous condition. The south facade collapsed entirely in the early 2000s. That means essentially until about um, the early 20th century, this building built in the seventh century was standing, was pretty much complete. So, so this deterioration is quite recent. Muren, this is the church, it's called Muren, stands in a military zone. So it is located almost on the border with uh, Armenia and that border is a closed border. So because it is in a military zone, it is, you are not allowed to go there. So it's forbidden to, to go, you can't get research permits. This presents a huge problem um, of uh, how do you intervene? And, and that's, it's been a struggle um, that I've been dealing with now for many, many years and will continue to. The other piece of this is the seismicity of the region. This is an earthquake prone region, which means that the buildings are always um, uh, at the mercy, let's say, of the tectonic plates. I'm just gonna show you, oops, one other um, example. If I can just go to my second picture to show you that this is in the same region as Marin. You have many other churches. This one is a lot less known, but this is its condition. It's constructed uh, in a typical Armenian fashion using cut masonry cladding on a mortar core. And as you can see here, the mortar core is actually what's essentially holding this building up, not this, the cut stones. Um, you see here also a group of people. Um, and since, you know, for about 10, 15 years, I've been going to Eastern Turkey with different groups tasked with trying to figure out what the heck are we going to do with these monuments? How are we going to work with um, the Ministry of Culture and Tourism to make sure that they stand? And it is a compl complex process. It's a fraught process. Um, but ultimately, the, the positive piece is the kinds of people I've got to know through this process, um, not just fellow Armenians, but Turks, Americans, Europeans, people of all stripes and types whose interest, whose mission it is to try to preserve these monuments for future generations. So I've been honored to work with, um, with individuals and organizations who have that as their goal, above and beyond careerism or their own political agendas. Um, so this is another church called Tylar in the same region as Moran, sort of north, what is today Northeast Turkey. Um, I am, oops, I'm just going to finish with one last monument. How am I doing on time? Good? All right, we'll, we'll finish up in a few seconds. This is um, one last monument I want to show you in the um, city of Ani in Northeast Turkey, again, right on the border. Um, a, monu a site that has been inscribed in the UNESCO uh, World Heritage List already in 2016, and which is now undergoing, this monument's undergoing um, uh, careful restoration. So it's not all bad for the Armenian, Armenian monuments in Turkey. Some are getting um, good and scientific attention. Um, this church is one of those. Uh, but there are many different kinds of stories um, to be told. And for the most part, the Armenian monuments are in um, tremendous need. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. 
Okay, if I stop showing, yeah, the Armenian monuments are in tremendous need uh, for care. And so these are emergency, this is an emergency situation. Um, and the last thing I'll say is these, you know, you were talking um, earlier before we started recording about the, the communities that to whom this, these monuments mean something, the stakeholders, the living communities. For the most part, as you can see, there's nobody around. Those churches are without any um, immediate uh, um, populations. But, um, but the other piece, of course, is that there's a huge Armenian diaspora that has a vested interest in the health of these monuments, um, as well as local stakeholders of various types. But that's another piece that for a, uh, a worldwide diaspora, they're looking at these monuments and in, in great, with great anxiety. So um, it's a complicated, I think, heritage case. Uh, but, um, you know, you have to keep pushing. So that's what I do. And I'm, I'm, I'm keeping on trying to raise awareness about, about the monuments. And, and I'm thankful for this opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. That was fantastic. Uh, and you, I think, set the, the sort of the framework for Eric uh, quite beautifully. Because Eric, I mean, as the curator of religion for the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, you have an extraordinary space and platform, a museum that's inspiring. Um, it's also overwhelming, uh, but it's an opportunity to teach people and also to highlight one of the, I think, key features that Christina just mentioned, which is um, through education, the intergenerational transmission of knowledge and awareness that comes with cultural heritage. And your space of cultural heritage is in, in the museum. So, um, we, so tell us a little bit. Okay. Good afternoon to you all here. And good evening to those of you that are listening uh, from Greece. Uh, I thank you for this opportunity uh, to share and to talk about the work uh, that I do and, and to be a part of uh, this panel with these um, esteemed colleagues. Um, so I am the uh, Curator of Religion at the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, uh, D.C. Um, I, I, my background before coming to the museum, I taught religion and African American studies uh, at Harvard University. Um, and then coming into this wonderful world of uh, material culture and the, uh, this um, uh, to, to have this, uh, what to me is almost, which, which is a, a sacred trust, to begin to gather these, um, these, these different fragments uh, from around the country and, and outside of the country that help to tell the story of a people who, um, whose uh, sojourn in this land has not been uh, one that has been easy. As, um, as you may know that perhaps one of the most gruesome tales told in the history of the modern world is that of the African Genesis on the continent of uh, North America. Uh, if it was in 1619 um, that the, uh, black, the, 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 the black body uh, uh, became listed among the premier sites and subjects of violence uh, in the so-called New World. Um, uh, there is a, a historian, uh, a Princeton University historian, by the name of Albert Rabito, who talks about the involuntary removal of Africans from the continent, uh, uh, from the continent, and talks about the voyage, uh, the Middle Passage voyage. Uh, he talks about that as the death of the gods, and what he means by uh, this notion of the death of the gods is the deconstruction of, and the um, the the the, the uh, the eruption and, and um, attempts at erasure of all of the kind of semblances of religion for the people who were taken captive. Uh, but it was in uh, the plantations um, that, um, and in the slave quarters, that the Africans uh, engaging the fullness of their religious imagination reconstructed kind of um, religious systems. They took the fragments, and then many things that they used uh, uh, were vested with sacred meaning. And so part of the work that I do is this matter of trying to collect these fragments that have been um, scattered all around uh, the continent 
and in other places. Yeah, I was thinking even today about the things that were that the Africans had, the objects uh, that they used to work religion, that many of the things were buried as, uh, as, as life was so uh, touch and go, that you could be sold, um, that you could be sold to another state um, without even knowing what was going on. And so um, part of my work is to collect some of these, some of these fragments that remain. Um, and so um, though, the, uh, the, though the majority of the artifacts in our museum are uh, uh, religious artifacts are uh, Christian, uh, my charge is also to uh, begin to uh, collect from other traditions who do not know themselves as Christian. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, black Hebraic traditions, the esoteric traditions, um, you, you name it, that is the, uh, the charge. But also, uh, in addition to collecting and, and telling these stories from the, uh, from the museum, is this whole matter of education. Um, so we try to do a lot of pro, uh, public programming to begin to lift up these things. In fact, one of the uh, programs I was most excited about that we had, we had a conference a couple years ago called Recovering the Bones, African-American Material Religion and Religious Memory. Well, we brought a, a group of scholars. We brought uh, historians, historians of religions. We brought uh, archaeologists. We brought one paleontologist. Uh, that began to talk about um, how, how we can begin to tell the story of African-American religion, um, not just through texts, like which we always do, but, but, but through, through artifacts and three-dimensional um, artifacts. And one person we brought, um, uh, 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 Dr. Blakey from William & Mary, who has uh, revolutionized, really, the study of African-American um, archaeology. Uh, who, uh, through his work that he had done at the, uh, the, the African cemeteries in New York, um, he uh, gave a wonderful talk about, uh, the, about worldviews by looking at the, the kind of objects that were buried uh, with the Africans. Uh, sometimes they would, they would, um, they, there was food, different um, amulets, and different things that were buried with them uh, because it, it tells us a story about how. Um, they understood the passage from life to death, and then they also uh, looked at the the kind of the kind of um, ways in which uh, the trauma, uh, the, the ways in which you could read trauma from the bones of the Africans, and to look at ways and possible causes of death, and uh, the because of the extreme kind of uh, nature of the violence under which um, they live. So there's, there's the collections, there's the public uh, programming, um, and then there's also um, the research and writing, because we need to begin to write about these things, that our findings, and to, to share them with broader, with broader publics. Um, and so those are, those are some key components to the work that we're doing. Um, but there is, um, so, so, so it has also created some very interesting dialogues that happen um, within the Atlantic world, um, because as you know, um, the Africans were uh, sometimes, uh, they, were, they were sold um, to the islands of the Caribbean. Um, they, some of them had experiences in Canada. And you think about a person like Harriet Tubman, who we have actually a couple of her artifacts in our museum, 30, I think 36 or 37 things that came directly from her family. And one of them uh, was uh, her hymnal. Now, what's interesting about her hymnal is that um, this hymnal belonged to her, but I was asked to do an interview with the New York Times about it a, few year, a couple of years ago. And at the end of the interview, they wanted to know about matters of provenance. I answered all of her questions. She said, is there anything that, um, that we need to know about the, uh, the, the hymnal that that, um, that we haven't talked about. I said, well, there's a small matter that she was not able to read. So what does a hymnal mean for someone who, that doesn't uh, have the ability to read? And so I began to talk to her about religious meaning and that things have, so if you think this hymnal, her only this hymnal is about literacy, you miss the entire point. 
because things have been vested with, 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 with religious meaning and, and sacred significance. And so I, I like to um, think of my work as lifting up these different meanings of, of objects. It may, it may be um, a, a washboard, or it may be an instrument of praise that was used in the uh, quarters of the enslaved Africans. And so um, it is, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still very much um, an educator, but my classroom has become much larger and my students have become much older and much younger. And so I'm very delighted to be here with you all today and I look forward to the conversation. That was wonderful, thank you. Um, and again, thank you for helping us to think about um, the importance of cultural heritage, religious heritage, in terms of it's um, the plethora of um, material forms, but also intangible forms that help us to understand the meaning and the importance of cultural and religious heritage. And with that, I then turn now to, to Dr. Tonya Moropulu. And Tonya, you're a chemical engineer. You're the scientist. You're the hard scientist among us. And so, uh, and you're, you're prolific in terms of both, you know, the, the work you do as a scholar, but also in terms of the extraordinary work you do as a practitioner and a scientist and a chemical engineer um, and in material sciences in helping and preserving sites that help people to understand past and present meaning and hopefully future meaning. So uh, I'd like you to uh, share with us the work that you're doing or some highlights on the work you're doing uh, by way of introduction as well. And thank you for, for being with us. We have, we have Boston, Washington, and Athens on the screen. Okay, so it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and Father Aristarchos as well for the invitation. And thank you all for sharing a very interesting panel because cultural heritage is uh, really in crisis. And uh, what I'm going to present about Hagia Sophia uh, is an exemplary case of uh, how uh, cultural heritage could be violated uh, in its um, uh, status as heritage of the world, like uh, Hagia Sophia. And uh, in this case, uh, I would like to speak about, uh, so in um, our case, um, the Turkish uh, President Erdogan and his decision uh, is actually violating uh, the character of Hagia Sophia as a World Heritage Monument. And uh, uh, this is due to the unilateral uh, reuse of the monument, uh, which is uh, uh, shifting for, from a museum uh, to a mosque and um, uh, this is uh, uh, the actual problem because uh, a World Heritage Museum has to uh, promote all the values, all the historical eras and uh, the different uh, religious uh, or uh, uh, people's belief uh, and in this case uh, this is uh, uh, not a reality anymore. Uh, that's why uh, we are uh, uh, calling um, all uh, uh, the international uh, uh, community of uh, scientists uh, in preserving cultural heritage to sign our petition uh, to safeguard Hagia Sophia as a world heritage in its uh, multi-religious and uh, uh, multicultural uh, appeal to the world. Uh, in uh, our case, uh, this petition is signed by uh, me as the head of uh, the Greek team of the NTUA, which worked on Hagia Sophia, as well as the Emeritus Professor of Princeton University, Ahmed Chakmak, uh, who was leading uh, uh, the Princeton research team, uh, which along with um, the Bogazici University, the Candili Observatory of Earthquake Protection uh, has signed an MOU at 94 uh, regarding the implementation uh, of protective and preventive measures uh, which uh, uh, were uh, uh, focusing on uh, the earthquake protection of monuments in Mediterranean Basin. Uh, within this framework, 
uh, we we had uh, initiated education and uh, research work on uh, uh, the monument. Uh, we had uh, uh, enacted uh, Greek cultural cooperation for first time ever, and uh, that was ratified by the two uh, parliaments of Greece and Turkey. That means uh, it was uh, a very strong political uh, step ahead. And uh, uh, the Greek-Turkish cooperation in Hagia Sophia was the exemplary, the pilot case upon which it was uh, uh, founded. Actually, we had uh, worked uh, characterizing the historic mortars of Hagia Sophia, which were uh, the bearing elements uh, of the structural integrity of uh, this great monument uh, threatened by earthquakes. Uh, and uh, it was um, uh, revealed uh, the actual uh, mechanism of how they were uh, capable to absorb the uh, energy of the earthquake, the earthquake uh, without um, uh, failing. Uh, that's why the interdisciplinary study uh, between uh, civil engineers, material engineers, geologists, architects, archaeologists, uh, was based on uh, the assessment of the earthquake response uh, of the monument uh, during uh, real earthquakes and uh, the simulation uh, that was based upon it uh, of uh, by a finite element model, uh, the dynamic analysis of its uh, behavior and the static analysis uh, through the strong motion uh, measurements, uh, which were um, optimized based on the geotechnical studies as well. And um, then the protection interventions were planned uh, according to uh, the optimized uh, uh, compatible restoration mortars, uh, which uh, were to simulate the historic ones. Uh, in uh, our case, this intervention, in our case, this intervention uh, was to safeguard Hagia Sophia from the earthquake of 99. And um, that was a real uh, uh, fact. Capius uh, Ben from, I'm sorry. So that was a real fact uh, during uh, uh, June of 99. Uh, it followed the earthquake of August 99. And uh, uh, the monument remained intact. Uh, nature was uh, presenting uh, uh, this uh, achievement uh, and Ahmed Chakmak presented it at CNN saying the God of Greece and the God of Turkey uh, saved Hagia Sophia, uh, something which is not happening today. Uh, however, the achievements of this cooperation uh, were um, dealing with uh, the diagnostic study of the mosaics of Hagia Sophia, uh, of all the historic periods, uh, of different uh, decay patterns, uh, through non-destructive techniques, uh, which permitted us to allocate clustered areas uh, uh, which uh, were uh, covering mosaics, uh, which permitted us uh, to ameliorate the UNESCO's conservation strategies and uh, materials and uh, of course uh, opened Hagia Sophia to the youth of the world studying on site uh, what uh, had to be done in order to reveal the mosaics and uh, all uh, the meaningful um, architecture of Hagia Sophia. Uh, that was the book about um, the Greek intervention uh, presented by uh, His All Holiness uh, Panagiotatos Patriarch Varfalomeos of uh, Constantinopolis. And the, the last revealed mosaic, it was the face of the angel by the architect Hassan Philandiker. Uh, today he is writing in his Facebook uh, that the angel is crying. Uh, I believe uh, uh, we have uh, a lot to do 
uh, in order to cease this violation and to reverse uh, this uh, annulment of uh, the monument. Uh, Hagia Sophia is uh, the Justinian Hagia Sophia, uh, a great Byzantine architecture uh, which is uh, uh, in a way uh, incorporating uh, the spirit of orthodoxy and Christianism as a whole, uh, as it concerns the man uh, who is uh, uh, looking upon the light. And that's the Greek word, anthropos, anothroski, you look upon to the light. Uh, so let's work together uh, to cease this violation and uh, to reverse uh, this crisis, which is a political crisis and for reasons of power. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moropoulou, and thank you for, <coughs> for helping us to understand the, the technical dimensions of cultural heritage preservation um, and also highlighting the significance and importance of inter, um, uh, interdisciplinary cooperation. Um, I, I want to take a step back um, and ask a general question because all of you have in some ways highlighted um, have highlighted pain and loss uh, in the work that you, you all do and um, emphasize the way in which preservation uh, can teach people about the causes of that loss and pain and hopefully prevent future loss and pain. Um, and that's a kind of universal message. There may be local expressions of it, but there's a universality to what all of you are saying and what you do. And I wonder if you could say um, a little bit about this moment now of COVID-19, where there's a lot of conversation about how you know, the, the, the pandemic has made people more aware of the connections between local and global and specific and universal. And I wonder if you see that in your work at all, um, if during these months of pandemic, in the space of cultural heritage preservation and protection, you see a, a, an increased awareness and a commitment maybe um, to ensure that loss and pain of the past um, doesn't continue into the future. Um, who would, oh, maybe we'll start, why don't we go in order? We'll start with you, Christina, and then we'll go. Uh, to Eric and to Tonya, okay. Yeah, thank, thank you, what a great question. Um, I think, you know, I've been, this, this crisis with COVID-19 has put me into all kinds of uh, reactions, including denial, depression, furious work, because maybe I won't live, to, you know, very long. Um, and, uh, but what I've tried to do in the, in the best of moments is just keep working, just keep working. It's the only way I know how to deal with this. And, um, by that, I mean um, research and writing um, and keeping on teaching students. Because for me, the students teaching them and training them and, and talking to them about how can they keep doing their work when they can't do field work, you know, is, is, is the most important thing. And, and um, you know, I think that for those of us who are a little older, who aren't, you know, um, university students anymore, um, we've all seen crises that have brought our work to a halt. Um, and uh, so one of the things I try to do is talk to my students about, you know, how, what's the best way to respond to this? And so I've tried to use it when I'm not pulling my head over the, over the covers over my head. Uh, when I, I try to use it as, as a way to say, look, what can we do? You know, okay, we can't go to Turkey right now but we can read every darn archival source that is out there. Because what is amazing to me is how much you can learn by going over your old photographs. I've actually found frescoes using Photoshop that I never knew were there. Because I was just, you know, I've taken a million photographs at Ani, now maybe is a good time for me to look at them. Same with just yesterday, I was looking at a photograph of a madrasa in Erzurum and here's an Armenian spolia, a cross on the wall in this Islamic school from, you know, probably the 10th, 11th century. So, so I try to be resourceful. I try to find ways at home to, to do my work, to keep, to, to keep involved and, to, and also at the same time to teach. 
um, because that's something we can do with the luxury of, of um, Zoom and other means. So I'm not sure that was an answer to your question, but no, no, I'm sure it's my response. <laughs> no, no, this is uh, because, uh, uh, again, I mean, the, the crisis, you know, the COVID-19 crisis is a, an opportunity for us to reflect on what we all do with cultural heritage, what you all do. And, and Eric, in terms of education, too, following up on Christina's point, and the moment in American, what's happening in the United States, um, you know, the microcosm of what's happening in the United States within the broader global context of, of COVID-19. I wonder if you see um, from, you know, your uh, vantage point and what you're doing at the museum that people are turning to the museum and understanding the, the value of the museum in terms of looking backward and addressing this current moment. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you. I think this is a great question. Um, one of the uh, one of the lessons or the points of reflection uh, that I am hearing about and seeing and experiencing myself is this idea about the you know the frailty of of of, of life. And so, as people think about um, all of the death the death notices, the friends and loved ones and people we are connected to uh, who are contracting the virus and passing on. Um, people are thinking, I think, in, in, in new and deep ways about what they want, uh, what, what they want to leave to the succeeding generations and what they must leave, um, the stories that must be told. Um, so I get calls from people now um, uh, saying that they have, they've had all of these things um, and things back from the, you know, the early 1900s, things that have been in their families since the 1800s. And, um, and they're, they're obviously they've, they've aged and they want to um, talk to me about how, um, given, given the kind of um, consciousness that COVID has provided, um, how can we begin to have some serious conversations with the museum about some of the th these things? We didn't want to give them away before. We want these things to, 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 to outlive us. And they're important lessons that these artifacts and these objects that they need to tell. Um, also, um, you know, we, we've been very interested during the crisis uh, to collect, even from re um, religious communities now, during the crisis. Because we always like to tell ourselves that we're not just, when we collect, we're not just collecting for ourselves right now, but our collections are for the future. And how are these religious communities navigating um, this new space? Uh, uh, some churches, um, uh, some religious communities that they've never had an online presence before. And so now they have to think, uh, uh, quickly learn how they're going to do it. Some people uh, who lead these communities are are already older people, and they feel like that that's beyond their ability to, to grasp. And so uh, these different ways in which people are trying to uh, continue community, people are writing each other again, saving these letters. Um, all of these things, I think, um, uh, this, uh, this moment helps us to begin to think about. Um, but I also was thinking, as you, as you asked the question, um, there, there's also this whole question about um, what's happening in our neighborhoods, um, gentrification. Some of these, some of these buildings uh, that were built by Africans, they were occupied by by, by people of African descent for for over a hundred years. Um, people are beginning to think about what, what does this mean for our building? Will we still be able to afford? Being in this big space, though our congregation has declined, but this building has been a haven for, for people of African descent for over 100 years. How can we save these, these buildings? And so I think that, it, that this moment raises those questions in a, in a, in a very uh, fresh and a, and a new way. Thank you, thank you. And, 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 turn, and turning to you, Tonya, um, and again, um, you know, sort of pivoting from what Eric and, and Christina discussed, you, you highlighted the fact that, you know, last week there was the announcement by Turkey's President Erdogan about the reversion of Hagia Sophia 
to a mosque, from a museum back to a mosque. Earlier it had been a, a, a church, a cathedral, Byzantine Orthodox Cathedral. But I wondered um, if you could say a little bit about the cooperation that you describe between U.S., Greek, and Turkish partners when it came to understanding the universality of Hagia Sophia and whether or not there's any active attempt to sort of uh, capture that, recapture that sensibility in the face of the decision on Turkey. Uh, I believe that um, we have to actually raise our voices uh, on an international level against this uh, unilateral reuse, uh, which is violating uh, the meaning and the values of uh, this uh, world monument. And uh, uh, this is indeed the pre-requirement uh, in order to uh, preserve and sustain the monument uh, in the Turkish ground through international uh, cooperation without which uh, it uh, will stay there um, uh, without all uh, the power uh, of uh, not only its life cycle, but uh, mainly its values. Uh, because reuse has to do with values. And uh, if you um, discriminate uh, the, the use of a Christian monument, uh, if uh, you do not preserve it uh, along with uh, other religious uh, uh, liturgies, then uh, you are destroying it. And uh, the reason that uh, uh, Erdogan decided to annul the museum character, which Ataturk has enacted at 1934, uh, was uh, a, a political reason. This is obvious. And in this case, uh, this decision is going to weaken not only the international cooperation on the monument, but even uh, the scientific cooperation on the monument and the scientific work on the monument. So in um, uh, the era of COVID, I would say that while um, financial resources are eliminated, while uh, borders and frontiers are closed, uh, while uh, chauvinism is empowered and uh, while unilateral decisions are taken, uh, we have to act and to sustain world heritage because world heritage is preserving the values of this world. Uh, multicultural values, multi-religious values, values for all humanity and uh, this is the key for the future. So please sign the petition on international level. We will present it to the UN and to UNESCO. And uh, we will ask uh, all international institutions and the national representatives as well uh, to sustain Hagia Sophia. All right, thank you. thank you again for this, you know, all of you taking us from the very local to the very global. And, and, I, and I want to um, give you a question that's come in from one of the viewers, which speaks to this global, lo local, and also historical continuity. And the question is actually for Eric. We can start with you, but we can certainly, um, you know, uh, go to, to Tonya and Christina as well. The question is, can you talk a little bit more about your experience collecting fragments of religious objects of black communities of the Muslim and Jewish Hebraic faith? Given the possibility that these artifacts have been destroyed, how do you work with communities to narrate that story with your curated exhibits? Yeah, so so I'll, I'll give you one uh, for instance. Uh, there is a community um, uh, that uh, in 1967, uh, they, uh, Ben Ami Ben Israel was the leader's name. He was from Chicago, and he took a he had a vision uh, that he was to lead these uh, this group of African Americans uh, to to um, to Liberia. He took them to Liberia, and um, they stayed there for a year. And in '68, they went to um, uh, 
they went to Demona, Israel. Um, the state of Israel um, get, gave them uh, permission to stay in their community. Is there, and today there are over 5,000 um, African Americans that live in Demona. A Ben Ami Ben Israel's son contacted me at the museum, and um, he wanted to, this was after his father had passed, uh, that he wanted to share some of the, uh, he wanted to know about, um, because his story was such a large story, and it's African American religion and transnationalism, um, also that this community understands itself to be a Hebraic community. Um, uh, he invited us to come over to what they call the New World Passover. And uh, we were actually on our way there um, uh, in, in March. Um, but the, uh, the virus arrived. And um, so, so that, that, that's one example of, of inroads um, within that world to, 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 tell, um, to tell those stories. Um, but we also... Um, Every event we have, we try to uh, make sure that we have different religious traditions at the table because I mentioned earlier that so much of the material that had been collected um, um, was Christian material. That we have, we have, um, came, we, we came up with a collection plan. We're actually uh, trying to uh, make inroads with other communities, uh, but at the same time, some of the curators, like the curator of art, uh, curator of music that they were collecting also. And so many of the, many of the artifacts, they overlap. But as a, uh, the, the religion team at the museum, we didn't start until uh, maybe a month after the museum opened. And so our work is before us. We did what we call a deep dive and looked into our holdings to see what was there. And now uh, from that, we generated a collection plan. And now we're going out to all of the communities and making, creating uh, relationships with people from different religious communities to, to provide us inroads into those into those communities as well. well any any follow up from Christina and Tonya on that point or no? I had the blessing uh, to work uh, as a chief scientific um, supervisor uh, for the rehabilitation of the Holy Editor, the Tomb of Christ in Jerusalem. Uh, I had the experience to work. Uh, in an environment of uh, two different people and three different religions, uh, the Christian, the Jewish, and the Muslim. And uh, within the Holy Sepulcher, uh, to unite on the scientific basis of decision-making uh, the three Christian communities, the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate, um, the custody of the Holy Land and the Armenian Patriarchate of Jerusalem. So um, when we opened the Tomb of Christ uh, seven centuries uh, after, uh, we had uh, a unique experience, uh, not just to collect uh, religious uh, uh, assets, but uh, uh, to experience uh, uh, the energy of uh, opening the Tomb of Christ. And um, I want to say that these experiences, uh, which were uh, presented, uh, transmitted to the humanity through National Geographic uh, Strategic Alliance and communication of this project, um, uh, were followed by two billions of people. Uh, that was um, an event that uh, brought every month all the media uh, to be informed in front of the uh, construction site of the Holy Editor. And uh, that means that society uh, was participating per se and was along with uh, the Tomb of Christ protecting this work and permitted us uh, to accomplish it. Uh, so this interactivity between humanity uh, monuments preservation and religion in a multi-religion environment uh, with peace and uh, understanding and communication uh, is the major tool where interdisciplinarity and scientific expertise might flourish 
for the benefit of the monuments and for the future of the world. Well, so okay, that's great. You've offered some hope here. And Eric, your your comment, uh, your previous intervention in some ways did as well. Um, and I want to ask you, um, you've all in some way, shape, or form highlighted the politics of cultural heritage work. Um, and throughout this series, uh, beginning with the first one, uh, for example, with Professor Bonnie Doherty at Harvard Law School, or um, you know, in the third one, uh, the discussion about um, religious cooperation and or lack thereof and sustainability, the issue of um, states as those actors who are meant to be responsible in a world organized, at least theoretically, according to international law. States are meant to protect um, cultural heritage, and yet we see that oftentimes it's the politics of states uh, that help to explain the destruction of heritage. And the flip side of that, and this is where the hopefulness comes in, you talk about at the local level where there is cooperation, collaboration, a sense of understanding of the importance of maintaining and sustaining heritage, both for living communities and the memory of communities gone. So I wondered if you could say a little bit more about your experiences at the local level and, and the gap, but maybe think, uh, you know, reflect a little bit on the gap between local will, even where there's, you know, difficulty and it's not always smooth, but local will and a willingness to even risk and try to cooperate versus what we see at the level of states, which oftentimes politicize and instrumentalize heritage at the expense of their own citizens and, and, and the world community. So I wonder if I could start with you, Christina, and then we'll, we'll again, we'll go through uh, for each of you. Sure. Um, so over the years, um, I can say working on these monuments, one is essentially always involved with the state on some level or the other, because you're getting permits, um, you are trying to arrange site visits, um, so, but the, the idea of the state, as you sort of alluded to, it's very abstract, you know, like, for example, I, I applied for a research permit to go to Moran and I get a kind of random email back from the ministry saying, sorry, no, you can't go. Um, on the other hand, all my visits to the sites and all my um, interactions with groups, including um, including representatives of the state, so on the local level, so museum officials in um, local municipalities, mayors, um, representatives of the Ministry of Tourism and Culture, um, I've had, you know, um, very good, amicable, productive encounters. There's something about going to a site with someone, looking at them, talking face to face, um, that, you know, I'm always hopeful about. And I have to be because the alternative is just um, to shut down and then it's, that's never going to be good. So I think, and I think too, I'll say with the Armenian case, um, and this speaks a little bit maybe to what, what Eric was talking about, there are um, individuals in, in the states, in the diaspora, who want to preserve the churches of their homeland, whether it's in Northeast Turkey or Southeast Turkey or in, um, in Kayseri, Caesarea. And so they are reaching out to the mayors in those places. They are just saying, look, you know, what, what, what can we do together? Or even just if it's in somebody's backyard. I mean, there's a church in Vaughan, in the Vaughan region in Southeast Turkey. Um, that is in somebody's backyard. It's a really important church. We have a feast for it in the Armenian church even. But um, the question is, well, it it's, it's doesn't have a dome anymore. So the landowner is just covering it with tar. He wants to save it. He doesn't want it to fall down. And there are people in LA who want to save it. So, so what's interesting is watching these individuals, these individual actors who are making connections and trying to do things and um, together. I mean, you hope it's being done with good standards and all that. But what it speaks to is a kind of sub-level of heritage that's happening. Um, that I think is also showing the impatience with the incredibly slow moving glacial um, uh, process of, of getting anything done through the ministry. 
of culture and tourism. So I, it's, there's a, you know, I, I've experienced different ways of dealing with state and local actors and it's, um, it's complicated, but I think there's, there is hope. Well, okay, so again, trying to amplify the message of hope, I'll go to you, Eric. And I mean, the Smithsonian, of course, we know uh, in the United States, the Smithsonian Museum, all of the museums that fall under that umbrella get federal funding, state funding at the federal level, but also have other sources. I wondered if you could say, you know, with the support, um, the formal support of federal funding, um, whether or not at the local level, there is a, um, you know, a recognition of how important that is. And if you see that kind of, you know, um, willingness of people at the local level to almost lead, um, lead state makers who may or may not realize the importance of what, you, what you're doing. Um, tell us a little bit about the local community level versus the gap at the, at the state level. If there is one, maybe there's cohesion, but I think it's fair to say there's not always. Yeah. How, how, how I, will, I will enter into this, um, uh, this topic is there is great interest within religious communities around preserving objects, uh, preserving um, uh, documents, uh, preserving. Um, and, and, so, and so so we actually have... Um, through a, a philanthropist, Robert Smith, uh, there's a, a, a center uh, in the museum uh, that, that actually allows us to go out to talk to people about um, preserving um, these, 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 these artifacts. Um, and, these, uh, and we also have, um, we even send out, we have a, a truck that goes out to digitize artifacts and those kinds of things, as well as we have these with these, these big events we call it, uh, treasures. We, uh, we have one event called Save, um, Save, Save African American Treasures, where the curators would also go out, the conservators would go out, and people could bring uh, artifacts to us. And then we would talk to them about how it could be uh, conserved and preserved. Um, and often, when we go out like that, sometimes people will say to us, you know what, we really think this is something that we would be interested in donating to the museum. So that's always wonderful um, when that happens. But also because our museum has a curator of religion, I'm also often called um, to places like sites. Uh, one is the Bethesda African Cemetery, which has been just a long strug struggle that they've had with uh, developers and with the city, um, uh, Bethesda, Maryland, around ensuring that this sacred site, that there's not a Starbucks built on top of this, this sacred site. Their ancestors are buried there. And so um, my role in those, in those kinds of situations are to talk about the importance of, of preserving this as a sacred site and to, to use my voice in, in, in that regard. Um, but also, as I mentioned earlier, as place, cities like D.C. and New York and Philadelphia, uh, these, these uh, buildings of these congregations that have been, um, uh, some of them built by Africans and have been sacred, sacred places for uh, over 100, 150 years. And now um, the developers are coming in and turning, uh, like D.C. is a prime example, uh, these, they're like, Really, these really posh lofts and these condominiums. And so people want to know, what can we do so we won't lose our buildings so the generations can know uh, that we were here and what, that this, this church was, that this, this was not just a church, but this was a school. This was a place, uh, this was a community center where people uh, came and negotiated, uh, 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 negotiated uh, uh, liberation. And so I'm often called into those kinds of conversations. But in those settings, I know myself as a, as a teacher and as a historian and as one who has a reverence for sacred things. And so I use my voice um, in that way. Oh, these are, these are fantastic. I mean, the kind of granularity that you all bring to this um, so that cultural heritage is not an abstraction 
in fact, it's about people's lives and their their existence and remembering that and honoring that is is fascinating. And I want to turn to you, Tonya, because on the same note, because although you've been talking about the case, the particular case of Hagia Sophia and Turkey, you've done work all over the Mediterranean basin. So um, from you know Venice, Italy to uh, to Egypt at the Temple of Luxor. And I wondered if you could say again a little bit about local communities in those spaces around the Mediterranean basin and how they today understand or don't understand. May, do they understand themselves as part of a shared um, you know, historical experience and how you deal with that and you see that at the local level in some of these other projects you've worked on? Uh, I believe that um, local people uh, know better their history and uh, their roots are uh, really uh, roots um, uh, of interactivity of different people and civilization in their places. Uh, working, for instance, in uh, uh, Veglia in Italy, uh, which is the ancient Elea uh, in Magna Grecia. Uh, I was discovering uh, uh, the technical uh, remains of uh, uh, our ancient Greek uh, uh, civilization and uh, uh, the Italians uh, were appreciating this. I mean, they were speaking of Magna Grecia. Or uh, when I was working for uh, uh, the protection of the medieval city of Rhodes, my native uh, place, uh, there we were, on the contrary, uh, having the conscience, uh, the local people, uh, that here uh, this uh, world heritage, the medieval city of Rhodes, uh, is um, a result of uh, the added work and value of uh, um, the Venetians, uh, of uh, uh, the Knights of Malta, the Knights of St. John, um, uh, all uh, the tongues of Auvergne, of Spain, uh, of uh, France, of Italy, as we say. Um, that is, uh, it is a concerted action that developed through history this civilization and its footprint, uh, this uh, cultural asset, uh, which is our uh, medieval city of Rhodes. So this uh, develops the mentality to the local people that we have to preserve this city as an open lab, open lab for sustainable preservation of historic cities where all the people of the world might introduce their own um, uh, input and experience and contribute uh, to the final act. So uh, this is something that a person which has never been to a university uh, can understand. Uh, and uh, we are open to the world. And um, believe me, in the islands, especially in the islands where um, uh, external economies are uh, um, assured through tourism development. Uh, this is uh, a clear conscience through every day's life, especially today because of the elimination of the tourism current because of COVID. Uh, we have a crisis and uh, this crisis uh, is uh, once again uh, proving that only external economies, only an open world might preserve local societies and give them future as well. I, this, this is great. I, I, I want to um, follow up on two questions that are directly related to this point. They both relate to sort of what can citizens do? Uh, what can happen in civil society? And from each of you, if you had sort of, you know, one recommendation for um, you know, whether it's students, whether it's non-students, or whether it's, you know, local peoples, what, what would be your most important recommendation about um, how to participate purposefully and actively in uh, cultural heritage preservation and why it's important? 
if if you had one one thing to say, what would you say to the, those questions? And there are two that are almost the same. Um, let's let's go backward. We'll start with you, Tonya. We'll go to Eric, and then back to Christina. Uh, I would say to the people of my home country, of my island, and to the people of the world, they have to demand and to struggle uh, in order to preserve their settlements. Uh, because their settlements are the settlements of our culture. And uh, the preservation of their everyday life is the key for the preservation of our civilization. In two words. Okay, all right. And Eric? Yeah, I, I think that um, a couple of important things, um, or, or organize, um, it, it, it is very important that, that the people organize themselves um, around um, and, and to connect with other like-minded people, other people who, who struggles parallel your struggle um, and learn from each other. But what are the best practices? Um, uh, who, who are the um, who are the other stakeholders in the community? Um, who, who, who would also, uh, uh, who also think it's, thinks that it's important that, um, that this church is not torn down or this cemetery is not um, uh, developed over? Um, so, so, so I think that those things are important. But the other thing that I think is really important is to, um, it's very important that we, we capture um, the stories of the succeeding generations and those who are the uh, the use the language of um, uh, uh, E. Franklin Frazier, the bearers of the culture. Um, who are those? Uh, who are those people? What we've done, and we 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 started a, a an oral history project where we've been, you know, we, we've definitely been interested in talking to millennials and others, but but definitely the the seniors. Mm -hmm. So they can begin to tell us those stories. And why exactly is this place a sacred place? And, and what are the different dimensions of its sacrality? Um, and so I think that to get, to get the generations talking, um, I think that's, that's very important. All right. Uh, that's wonderful. And Christina, now to you. Yeah, just, uh, well, I, I second what Tanya and Eric have said, but I would say finally, just don't give up because it's so easy looking at the news just to say, forget it. No one is ever gonna care about this monument and it's gonna fall down tomorrow. So, but do not give up. You have to keep going. You have to keep teaching students, um, teach, teach these, the generations that are, that are below you because I think we were all talking about too, these, we hope these monuments or these objects are going to outlive us and then they will have new custodians. And we need to make sure those custodians are, are, are learned and, and care. And so with go, thinking about that, it's important to just keep at it, you know, keep trying to get attention for the monuments and advocate um, for the material culture because it's what we must do. Well, can I can I ask you all then? We have you know a little bit of time left, and I want to slightly turn in a different but related direction. In some ways, you've all described uh, people, and at the and particularly at the local level, in terms of you know your um, your ex your positive experiences, people as as truth tellers um, and people as bearers of experience and stories, um, and and sharing those stories even where there's disagreement. Um, as a possibility for highlighting our, our, our shared humanity. At the same time, you've all touched in some ways on ec the word economy has, and economics um, have, has made its way into this conversation and in different ways. But we had a panel that talked about pro public-private partnerships, social impact investing. And I wondered if you could say a little bit from your experiences about another stakeholder um, in the economics and the commercialization of cultural heritage protection. Um, and that's the, the private sector, both the local and global private sectors. Uh, what message would you send to private sector actors 
about their responsibility in participating in the kind of respect for sacredness, whether we're talking about religious sacredness or cultural sacredness or simply sacredness for humanity. What would you tell the private sector and what private sectors about um, how to help you do what you do? Um, let's start, let's go the other direction. We'll start with you, Christina. I would say to, so in, in, in my work, um, and when I think about private sector economy and the monuments, I think about, for example, villages near monuments where they might make money off of um, travelers to, to the monuments, that is, tourists uh, who are going because they're interested in their heritage, so visiting churches. And, and so um, that's one element of private, the private sector. Um, there are private sector actors who want to preserve monuments. Um, maybe they're of Armenian heritage and, and, and they have money. I would say in either case, it's crucial to actually learn what it is you're, you, you're, you're either benefiting from or you're, you're donating to. What is this monument? So I think it's, it's, it's again, as I said before, it's, it's, it's crucial for the private sector to understand um, what it is that they're supporting or, or gaining from. Um, yeah, that's, that's where we go with that. Okay, all right. Uh, Eric, you, you've kind of touched on the private sector and maybe I miss, you know, sort of misquoting or misinterpreting what you said, but sometimes the private sector as more about extraction and destruction than about preservation um, when it comes to um, sacred sites and the peoples who once lived there and who should remember them. Um, can you say a little bit about the private sector and how that relates to maybe what Christina yeah. just said? Yeah. I, 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 what I would say to that is that, um, you know, fr fr from the side of the people, um, from the side of the people, and the inhabitants of these communities and the bearers of these traditions, um, they have a, a different range of issues. They're not trying to uh, necessarily make money over the, everything is not about the dollar. That this is about our shared humanity, the collective struggle of our people. And I, I, would, I would want the private sector to, to, to understand that that I, I understand you want to build and this, you want this land to be developed and you want this neighborhood to be transformed, but a people struggled here. That a people um, negotiated what it meant to be free here. And so um, I think that th those conversations need to happen, that there should be some serious conversations about that. There was a guy, um, uh, a professor at Columbia University, he would say that the people's needs are holy. Now you have to, you have to, you have to really give ear to what the people need and what has sustained them and those those traditions, those institutions that sustain them. Uh, that maybe we can find another place um, to develop another another area to develop and mm -hmm. let's see how we could partner with them to, to help them preserve what 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 is. Um, in, a, in, a, in a culture that denied them their humanity, uh, the institution that was the only place where they could be human in the world that was inhumane toward them. All right, all right. And Tonya, how about, you, you touched on economics from a slightly different direction, but I, I think in a way that we can understand economics and cultural heritage, the intersection having both positive and negative kind of connotations. So, and, and expressions. Say a little bit about that, if you will. In uh, my country and in other countries of the world, uh, the preservation of cultural heritage uh, was uh, accounted at the expense of public resources. Uh, that is coming to an end. Uh, on the other uh, hand, it is uh, a fact that today, uh, revenue might be developed through the reuse of historic buildings, for instance. That means that the private sector might be attracted uh, to new investments in cultural heritage preservation. And uh, this is the trend today. 
what we have to do in order to develop a really circular economy, which is the need, which is going to uh, develop the interface between uh, reuse and protection of cultural heritage to assure from the revenue of the reuse uh, the expense for the protection. Uh, this is the need. So we have to work, especially uh, the scientific community, in this end uh, to develop optimization and plans where the compliance between the values of heritage and uh, the actual enhancement in uh, uh, temporary economy uh, will be uh, a reality. So again, you, we end on a positive note, which is great, because we are at the end of our, um, of our segment, um, and we're at, at the end of the five-part series. And I want to thank all three of you again, um, Professor Christina Moranci, Dr. Eric Williams, Professor Tonya Moropoulou, uh, for a fascinating discussion. Um, and thank you for um, your own form of kind of truth-telling, both the, you know, the positive and the negative, the loss and the hope that's associated with, with heritage preservation. Uh, I again want to thank the organizing committee for this series, um, along with our initiative on religion, law, and diplomacy at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Um, we also had uh, Reverend Dr. Arista Jos-Krakas from the National and Capodistrian University of Athens, and we also had um, the other co-sponsor, Mr. Lucas Katsonis, um, with um, the pre who's the president of the Foreign Affairs Institute in Greece. And then finally, and especially, because we can all see and speak to each other, uh, the team of Brad Maycumber um, at the Fletcher School, Francois Venn, um, Areti Tsukalas in Athens, and also Cecilia Rosenman uh, from Seattle, Washington, all part of the the global um, community that brought this together. So thank you to everyone, and I sign off now and wish everyone well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.